Many of the social concerns of the 1920s, much of the high life, the parties, disappeared with the great stock market crash of 1929 that plunged the nation into the Great Depression. The stock market crash, however, did not cause the Great Depression. It was merely the final straw. The economy in various segments had been weak during the latter part of the 1920s. So when the market crashed in October of 1929, it took the rest of the economy down with it. Now, I'm not very good at economics, but let me give you a simplified version of the causes of the Great Depression. Part of it was foreign affairs in terms of tariffs. Part of it was a decreasing demand for manufactured goods, causing the manufacturing section segment of the economy to slump. Part of it was a crisis in, on the farm. Part of it was that credit had become easy during the 1920s and everything was great as long as you could pay back your loan. And finally, and perhaps the biggest problem, was the growing unequal distribution of income, the inequities in purchasing power between the wealthy and everybody else. Let's start with why the growing gap between the rich and the poor was a significant contributor to the Great Depression. During the 1920s, the wealthiest of Americans saw their income increase 75%, while everybody else, the 99% of Americans, saw their income increase only about 1% or 9% over the nine year period of the 1920s. Now you might ask, why does this gap between the rich and the poor matter? We hear it expressed today when uh, Bernie Sanders talks about the 1%. The reason it matters in the United States is that our economy has traditionally been a consumer economy. In the 1920s and today, about 70% of our economic growth is based on consumers, people buying stuff like goods and services. And so if the people have less money to spend to buy stuff, that means that there's not as much demand for stuff. Think of it this way. If there are a thousand rich people and 10,000 everybody else, and a thousand rich people buy a new car every year, that means that the automakers have to make a thousand cars a year. But if the rest of the people, that 10,000 people, buys a car every three years, say, that means the automakers are having to build 3,333 cars per year. Now, which is better for the economy? Making 1,000 cars a year or making 3,300 cars a year? I think you can see that the purchasing power of the American people drives a consumer economy. And no matter how much wealth and how lavishly they spend, the richest 1% is not going to spend enough to keep the economy going. 
the economy is dependent on you and me having the money to buy stuff. And if our wages are not increasing, if our purchasing power is not increasing, then the economy stagnates. And that's exactly what had been happening in the 1920s. And some say that's what's happening today. Farmers in the 1920s had been struggling. Remember, farming is based on being able to borrow money, credit. They have to borrow money to plant their crop, and then they pay it back when that crop comes to harvest. Well, that had been going on during World War I. But the premium that the government put on producing food caused patriotic farmers to go out and try to raise more food. They did this by buying new equipment, maybe by buying new land so they could grow more crops. And that was great as long as the federal government was buying the farm products to feed the troops. But after the war ended, the federal government stopped buying farm products. But the debt that the farmers had run up to try to meet the demand of the war did not go away. And so the farmers were left owing money, but not making as much for what they grew. They tried to produce their way out of it, grow more. If a price of a bushel of wheat was at a dollar during the war and it went down to 75 cents after the war, then they had to make up that 25 cents a bushel difference. So they tried to grow more bushels. But supply and demand says that if you supply more and the demand's not there, then the price continues to fall. So trying to produce their way out of their financial situation just got them into more and more trouble until by the time the uh, stock market crashed, about a third of America's farmers were already in bankruptcy. Another factor that weakened the economy so that after the crash we had the Great Depression, was speculation in stocks. The stock market went up during the 1920s. Many Americans, having become accustomed to buying Liberty bonds during the war, were looking for ways to invest their savings. And the stock market looked like a good deal because it kept going up. And so average Americans, middle-class Americans, began to buy stock on the stock exchange. And the Dow soared. And so people were making money as long as the stock market went up. But because more Americans were investing in the stock market, when it crashed, it took those Americans with them. It wasn't just your average American investing in the stock market either. Financial institutions, banks, were also investing, thinking that was a good way to make money. And often they were investing more than they should. They were speculating. As long as the market went up, they were good. Another common practice in the financial in, uh, industry at that time and today was called buying on margin. In other words, you would want to buy a stock, but you didn't have the cash to pay for it. So you would pay for some of it in cash and you would borrow the rest at a low interest rate. Then when your stock went up, you could sell it 
could pay off that loan and still make a profit. It's called buying on margin. And that works great as long as the stock market's going up. But when the market crashed, all of those people who had speculated, who had put more money in the market than they could afford to lose, all of those money who, people who had taken out loans to buy stock on margin, they were all left with nothing. And it the crash took all of them down with it. Now in a consumer economy, when consumer spending goes down, then the producers of the goods that they're buying don't need to produce as many goods. And if they don't need to produce as many goods, they don't need as many workers, so they begin laying off workers. That creates a fewer people who have money to buy stuff, and you get a downward cycle. The decrease in consumer spending, and that impacts the health of the economy. That had been going on in the late 1920s. Remember, we got into imperialism because we, need, we were making more stuff than we could buy domestically, and so we needed markets overseas. Well, when people stopped buying stuff, companies began to lay off people and cut back. That left fewer people could buy stuff, and you had the Great Depression. Now, I'm not going to go very deeply into tariff policy, but one of the things that had hurt the world economy were protective tariffs. You might remember that protective tariffs are those tariffs put on imported goods that make them more expensive than domestically produced goods, thereby protecting uh, protecting the domestic manufacturers. Well, South, Europe had a big problem after World War I. Germany had to pay back reparations. England and France owed the United States big bucks. And yet we had tariffs that helped prevent them from being able to trade freely with us to make the money they needed to pay us back. And then after the crash, in an attempt to protect American businesses, Congress passed the Hawley-Smoot Tariff, which was the highest tariff in the history of the United States. And as a result, world trade fell 40%. Now, if we were making so much stuff, we couldn't even sell it at home. We needed the world market, and that falls 40%. Once again, that impacts the industries, how much they need to produce. They have to produce less. They, they lay off people, and you get the downward cycle. Just a few months before the market crashed, Herbert Hoover had been sworn in as president. He was a Republican who believed in small government. He was not as devout and a proponent of laissez-faire as most Republicans, but he still believed in those kinds of principles. So when the market crashed, and the Great Depression began, he was very slow to see how serious it was and to try to take any kind of action. And this is partially because of his philosophy. He believed individuals should take care of themselves, the concept of American rugged individualism, that families should take care of themselves. And he believed in the Horatio Alger kind of thing of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. Don't depend on someone else. You go do it yourself. 
What he failed to recognize with the Great Depression was that people didn't have any bootstraps to pull themselves up with. Hoover's Secretary of the Treasury did not help his public image. Andrew Mellon was one of the richest men in the world. And so he suggested to Hoover that he just do nothing. He suggested that uh, just let the people figure it out for themselves. The depression will purge the rottenness out of the system. Enterprising people will pick up the wrecks of the less competent people. He is a pure social Darwinist. Now, this was his advice to Hoover. Hoover didn't follow it. But this kind of attitude began to turn public opinion against the Hoover administration. And Hoover, being slow to understand the seriousness of the problem, had initial reactions that were not very sympathetic to what the country was going through. Things like we cannot legislate ourselves out of a depression. The federal budget must always be balanced. Direct aid to the unemployed is not the American way. His solution was voluntary cooperation of industry and government. Not mandatory, but voluntary. He was going to try to sweet talk the financial institutions and the corporations into doing good things for their employees. And so based on this cooperation with business, he formed his Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which lent money to businesses in the belief that if the businesses had the money, they would keep their workers on. And that that money would then trickle down and stimulate the economy. The problem was twofold. Number one, businesses did not keep their employers on, employees on. They took the money and then used it to pay expenses to get through the Great Depression. So the money didn't flow out of the hands of those at the top down into the rest of the economy. The other major problem with this is that it was voluntary. The companies could take the money and really do whatever they wanted with it because there were no restrictions put on them as to how they spent federal money. Now, having said this, Hoover, with the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and some of his other programs, did more than any previous president to try to alleviate the problems of a, an economic depression. No previous president had done this much, primarily, again, because of the concept of laissez-faire. So Hoover took some measures. He just was not willing to go far enough. As a result, in the minds of the public, Hoover was to blame. That was unfair. Presidents who are in office when an economic recession happens usually get the blame. But most of the time, it is something that has happened before they ever became president that set the events in motion. That's the way it was for Hoover. But in the, between his bad public relations and it happening on his watch, he became the villain of the Great Depression. For example, when people lost their homes and were homeless and had to just build a little shanty town or a little some kind of uh, uh, a shack to live in, 
those shacks became known as Hoovervilles. And then in 1932, Hoover put a finishing touch on his standing with the American people. World War I veterans had been promised a bonus payment for their services, but it was not due for years after the Great Depression started. And so World War I veterans went to Washington, D.C. in a big march to lobby Congress to move the date for the payment of their bonuses up. Congress would not do that. It would unbalance the federal budget. And so the, these World War I vets camped out in Washington, D.C. to continue their demonstrations, try to get their the federal government to pay them bonuses that they had earned but were not due yet. Hoover's action was to run the bonus marchers out of town. He called in not just the local police, but also the army to force these marchers to disperse and leave town. The media captured these policemen and these soldiers going in and attacking the World War I veterans, those who had served their country. Now, can you imagine what would happen today if a group of veterans was attacked by someone from the federal government? It would be outrageous. And it was outrageous back then. It just showed to many in the American population that Hoover was out of touch with what was really going on. And images like this of the burning bonus marchers camp just reinforced to the American people that this was all Hoover's fault. That was not fair, but that's what the great majority of Americans came to believe. And this opinion of Hoover was reflected not only in calling the homeless towns Hoovervilles, but also in signs like this. Hard times still Hoover over us. Hoover's poor farm. In the minds of the American people, Herbert Hoover was to blame for their situation. It is against this background of the federal government and particularly Herbert Hoover being blamed for the problems that many Americans were having because of the Great Depression. It was in that atmosphere that Franklin Delano Roosevelt ran for president in 1932, promising the country a new deal. Hoover ran a, an expensive campaign, used all of the modern technologies like talking motion pictures to promote his reelection bid. But some observers said that Hoover kind of went about the campaign as if he knew he was already beaten, and indeed he was. So in 1933, FDR is sworn in as President of the United States. And in his inaugural address, he makes it clear that the American people are not at fault. This Great Depression is not something that they should be blamed for. He says the people did not fail. The, pe the ones that failed were businesses. 
the exchange of the, the rulers of the exchanger of mankind's goods have failed. The practice of the unscrupulous money changers, the banks and financial institutions, stand indicted in the court of public opinion. And he went on then to say, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Showing that he knew that part of his job was to be a, be a cheerleader for hope, that yes, things are bad, but we don't have to fear because together we're going to get through this. Now, on the day when FDR made that speech and he blamed the bankers and the businessmen for the failure, not the people, and he said, told the people, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Here are the conditions that the country was in when he was making those statements. Unemployment was at about 25%, almost 25%. Among non-whites, it was more like 50%. Somewhere around one third of Americans' farms were in bankruptcy. And you got to remember, when a farmer loses his land, he's not just losing his job, he's also losing his home and his family's home. So one farm failure results in an entire family being displaced and unemployed. Thousands of Americans were losing their homes. They couldn't pay the mortgage and were becoming homeless, having to sleep in their cars or pitch a tent. On the day that Franklin Roosevelt said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself, you had literally tens of thousands of men looking for work. Some would ride the rails, as they called it. The Railroad companies would allow them to jump onto freight cars. They couldn't find any work in one place. They would ride the rails someplace else in search of work. On the day that Roosevelt made his inaugural address and was sworn into office, you had thousands of so-called Okies fleeing the Great Plains, usually heading for California, carrying everything they owned. Any of you who have read Steinbeck's Great Grapes of Wrath, that's what it was about. The Okies leaving their farms on the plains and heading west in hopes of finding new opportunities. And one of the reasons that these farmers were fleeing the Great Plains was because of a, a disaster, an environmental disaster. They had plowed up the prairie grasses of the Great Plains and in doing so had exposed them to uh, the elements. Well, as long as it rained, it was good, rich soil, and they had bumper crops. But then, in the late 20s, it stopped raining, went into a cycle of drought, and the wind began to blow. And so all of that prairie grass had been holding down the soil, wasn't there anymore. And the wind began to blow the soil away. Any of you who've been out to West Texas, for instance, in the Lubbock area, you've driven outside of town, much of that land is sand. You have sand dunes out there. Well, that was part of the Dust Bowl. All the topsoil got blown away. 
These storms were so powerful and so dense that they would bury most everything. You had to dig out to get out of your house. There was no way you could uh, put rags under the doors to keep the dust out. People literally got lost and died trying to get from their house to their barn, much like a blizzard. Some of these storms are so powerful that they blew dust all the way to the East Coast and it made it so dark that the street lights had to be turned on in the middle of the day. And these storms ruined everything. What is it going to take to just try to uncover and get that piece of machinery to run again? And they destroyed people's lives. There was a thing called dust pneumonia that people would get from breathing the dust in the air. And so the so-called Dust Bowl existed throughout the Great Plains, but the epicenter of it was in the panhandle of Texas, Oklahoma, western Kansas, Colorado, New Mexico. That was the worst. And it destroyed farms. There was no way that after your topsoil blew away, you could plant a successful crop. And so the so-called Okies began to move out of the Dust Bowl, head for California, where they thought there might be farm work. But they were met like with signs like this, no jobs in California, keep out. And in fact, for a while, the state of California posted highway patrolmen at the border and they would not allow these Okies to come into the state of California. So when Roosevelt takes office, he is faced with a huge farm crisis, not only the Dust Bowl, but also of overproduction. As this cartoon shows, Texas had raised 13 million bales of cotton that they couldn't sell because there wasn't a demand to buy them. And this was happening throughout farm country. It was a true crisis on the farm. On the day that Franklin Roosevelt said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself, thousands of businesses had failed. This one strikes me also on a personal note. How many times have you driven by a strip center or something like that and a business that was open there before has gone out of business? Did you ever say maybe that business was somebody's American dream? That they thought they were going to be the next Sam Walton and Walmart? starting from that store, or the next McDonald's, or whatever. All those failed businesses, that is a failed dream. Private charities tried to contribute. They set up soup kitchens where people could go and get some food but they were overwhelmed by the demand. And I want you to take a look at this picture. You notice anything interesting about these men who are lined up to get a free meal? Are these bums or drug addicts? No, you notice they are wearing coats and ties. These are men who are stopping off to get something to eat and then going to look for a job. That was the strangest thing about life in the Great Depression, is that these 
folks were looking for work. It just wasn't there. Again, notice the appearance of these men in a bread line who are going to get free food. They're not bums. They're just ordinary people down on their luck because of the Great Depression. When Roosevelt became president, the banks were failing. This is partially because they had speculated in the stock market and lost money. But it was also because people fearing that their bank was going to fail rushed to the bank to withdraw their money so they wouldn't lose it. Because in those days, if a bank failed and you had money in that bank, you just lost your money. And hundreds of banks were closing and people were losing their money that they had put in those banks. Now, some of the closures were not because the bank was unstable. It was because of the runs on the bank by depositors. Remember, if you go down to your local Chase branch or something, if everybody has an account there, went there, and tried to withdraw their money, that branch would not have enough cash on hand to give everybody their money. And so that's part of what was happening and the people didn't understand it. And so when the bank said, well, you can only have, you know, $50 out of the 200 that you've got in the bank, people misunderstood and thought the bank was not in good shape. And so some of the closings were to stop this, this people withdrawing their money. Another thing to keep in mind is that on a very simple level, banks depend on depositors. That's the, where they get the money to make loans to other people. And so if depositors are taking out their money, then the bank doesn't have any money to lend to other people, and therefore it can't make money off of interest. So when Roosevelt becomes president, hundreds of banks have closed or are in the process of closing. Anytime there is the rumor that there are jobs available, you get huge lines of people to get those jobs. Studs Terkel in his book, Working, to recounts the story of a man in San Francisco during the Great Depression. He was out of work. Every morning he would get up at five o'clock in the morning, put on his best clothes, and he would go down to the waterfront, hoping to get a job for the day unloading ships. Hundreds of men would be standing around waiting. And at nine o'clock, the Foreman would come out and say, okay, today we need nine guys to unload ships. So nine out of those hundreds that had been there since before dawn got lucky and got a job for a day. Because during the Great Depression, people had worked and had played the game by the rules. They'd worked hard, they had been self-sufficient, and so they didn't want a handout. They didn't want charity. They wanted a job so they could take care of themselves and their family. Many of them were veterans who had worked all their lives. I know three trades, I speak three languages, I fought for three years, I have three children. I only want a job. People resorted to most anything they could think of to try to earn a little money. This woman probably went down to the local produce market, bought a box of apples, carried it up to the business district. So when the businessmen began arriving for work, she was standing there to sign her to sell her apples hoping to make enough money 
to be able to provide a meal for her family, perhaps, perhaps help pay the rent, and still have enough left over to buy another box of apples the next morning so she could do it again. In New York City, they had lines of people trying to get on jury duty because jury duty paid a dollar a day. And so they would have whole lines of people outside the courthouse every morning, hoping to get on a jury. Not charity, work. This song captures the attitude of most of the unemployed during the Great Depression. These were men who had played the game by the rules all their lives. They had been self-sufficient. They had worked hard. They had saved their money. Maybe they had even been able to buy a house. And now through no fault of their own, they found it all slipping away from them. They were unable to feed their families. They were unable to pay their mortgage payments and their families were ending up homeless. All because they had done everything right according to the rules of the game and it still hadn't worked for them. And so keep in mind when we talk about the unemployed in the 1930s, these were men who had been productive their entire lives and now found themselves in a situation that they had no control over and they were desperate to find a way to simply support themselves. As hard as the Great Depression hit the white population, minorities had it even worse. 50% of African Americans were out of work. They were told jobs were for white men. The racism and the segregation continued. The same for Hispanics. And Mexican Americans were encouraged to go back to Mexico. These are the same people who had been encouraged to come to the United States to work in the war industries during World War I because there was a labor shortage. But now that jobs are scarce, they are being run out of the country. 